uh, want to welcome everybody tonight uh, for joining this uh, another event, the Solar Management Consulting Club. Uh, this is our signature series of events where we bring you industry leaders from consulting companies and, and different business branches. Tonight, we have a really a new field to open for you. It's uh, innovation incentives and then tax breaks companies can get from investing in R&D and innovation. And we have a really high level guest from Deloitte, Davis Chu, senior manager in Deloitte, Vancouver, who's going to unlock this area of practice for us and shed more light and about his background and his uh, pivot to consulting. Uh, also some basic rules as usual, uh, wait for, for uh, the speaker to announce the point where you can ask questions, uh, raise your hands if you have questions, one of the moderators is going to call you out. Uh, if you want to learn more about the club also, we always invite uh, new people, you always welcome new people to join and please go to ubcsmcc.com and see what we're doing, see if it fits what you're expecting in your career and get in touch. Saying that, Satyam is going to be our event moderator today. I'll just uh, pass it on to him, and Davis can probably start with his pitch. Yes, and well, thank you, Daniel, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for for joining, and again, you know, thanks to the you know SMCC for for hosting me today. It's a you know pleasure to to connect with uh, my alma mater, you know, UBC. So. Uh, so this is really going to be an informal kind of presentation. You know, if anyone has any questions, just feel free to interrupt. Sorry if I'm breaking any rules, but you know, it's uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm easy going. I don't think my presentation is going to run that long. Um, so again, I, you know, we have a hour or so, um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, looking forward to, to I guess a discussion afterwards. Um, so just disclaimer, just standard. This is my own personal views. It, it's about me. Um, kind of, I'm, I'm pretty boring, so hope uh, you know. I don't think there's going to be too many um, you know questions at the end, but uh, we'll we'll see from that. Uh, so as as Daniel mentioned, um, so yeah, I'm Davis Chu. I'm a senior manager in Deloitte's global investment and innovation incentives practice. So I, I think you know when I was speaking with Daniel and setting up. Um, you know, this presentation, I think it was, you know, more around what my journey was and how I ended up with Deloitte. So I'm just going to start out with, with who is Davis Chu. So I think you've seen in, in sort of the intro, uh, I'm trained as a chemical and bioengineer. Um, first and foremost, I'm a husband and dad. I have a four-year-old and one-year-old. So you can imagine how, how fun the last year has been with COVID. I mean, it's, it's been great with them, but you know, if, for those of you that may be parents, we'll, we'll sort of understand uh, all of those fun challenges there. Um, so in addition to, to being trained in chemical and bioengineering, I spent six years in grad school. So I'm gonna, you know, go into this a little bit more, but uh, I, you know, it was a, a, you know, a pretty interesting time for me at UBC at the time. Um, you know, while I was in grad school, I'll, you know, earlier in the chat, I was sort of mentioning that, you know, I ended up taking some MBA courses through um, an engineering engineering management subspecialization option that I was able to take. And, and uh, you know, that was a really interesting experience for me where I've been able to sort of gain a little bit of, you know, business background and, and things that I've kind of, you know, took with me and, and uh, you know, continue using even to this day uh, from, you know, the things I, I learned. Um, so really with hobbies, you know, with young kids, I mean, my, my family is my hobby. That's where most of my spare time goes. And I also decided, you know, because I'm not busy enough, I decided to pick up a part-time PhD. So I'm, I'm doing it again in chemical and bio bioengineering. So I'm focusing on development of a AI-based platforms for rapid material development. So that's sort of the stuff that I just started. So you all may see me on campus one of these days when I'm actually there on campus. So a little bit more about me as well. So I'm just diving into business chemistry. This is a tool that um, you can Google it. I think there's some cool YouTube videos about it. It's a Deloitte tool that sort of analyzes people's business chemistry. So I found this a really useful tool just to kind of find out a little bit more about myself. So essentially with the business chemistry um, you know, program, 
there's there's sort of four areas where they kind of classify people. So there's the pioneers. Those are the big thinkers that you know they don't really get too detail oriented. They're the ones that are kind of dreaming off, at, you know, the the you know uh, you know big blue sky type projects. And then you have the drivers. These are the folks that you know are the ones that they put their heads down and want to get things done. They don't really care who's in their way. They will mow right through them and and get the job done. Um, and then you have the integrators. So these are the folks that are, are really great connectors. They're the ones that want to make sure everyone has their say. And um, they're the ones who are, are uh, uh, you know, really the ones that are, are focused on the relationships and building the teams and things like that. And then you have your guardians, which are totally on the opposite spectrum of, you know, what a pioneer is. Um, so they're the ones that are very, you know, detailed oriented. They want to see numbers. They want to see all the backup to what you're proposing. And, you know, they're very structured and, and, you know, practical. So those are sort of the four categories. You know, when I did, did this, I really thought I was probably more of an integrator or guardian, you know, just given my background as a chemical and bioengineer, but I actually turned out to be mostly driver and a pioneer. So that was a bit of a, a, a shock to me, but something that you know, once I kind of learned my business chemistry, it's something that I kind of embraced. And I found it's kind of helped me, you know, kind of move forward and, and, and focus on, you know, how, what makes me sort of happy and what sort of drives me um, and, and how, to, how I can best utilize my abilities, you know, in a team environment. So that's sort of about my business chemistry. Um, you know, Google it, it, it's pretty interesting. I don't know if people can just, you know, do it for free, but um, if you are able to, I would recommend uh, giving it a try. All right, so, um, you know, in my role at Deloitte right now, um, uh, you know, I get to do a lot of things, which is actually pretty interesting. So my main, um, I guess, uh, you know, sort of my main areas of practice are around helping companies innovate by um, basically fund, helping them find funding for their, their innovation. Um, and, and through this, I'm also, um, the, the BC Forest Industries cluster leader. So I'm focusing on really solving the important problems in the sector, which means bringing all of Deloitte in BC, you know, to solve some of their biggest issues. So it's not just tax, it's, you know, consulting our AI practice, all of that, um, you know, is, is what I end up, um, you know, bringing to the industry. Um, my main clients that I serve are, are mainly in the heavy industry. So mining, um, you know, energy, forest products, clean tech, biotech, ag tech. So those are all the sort of the areas that I focus in. Um, so I'll go on to the next slide. Sorry, are there any questions there? I see there's a little note on the chat there. So I just wanna maybe pause there. No, all good? Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's, it's just a comment by Abdullah that, that the software is not available, the business chemistry one. So it's oh, not okay. available publicly, yeah. We can All buy right. it on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> right. So a little bit about. Oh, I don't know if my little my my things probably there. Uh, anyways, so what do I? So in terms of. So in terms of the way that we help companies, there there's you know, a few categories of where, you know, companies can benefit from innovation incentives. So first off are the tax credits. So these are the indirect incentives. So in Canada, um, it's that the SHRED program or SRNED that you may have heard of, which stands for Scientific Research and Experimental Development uh, Tax Credit. It's a program run by the CRA. Um, so it's an entitlement program. So you essentially do the work. If that work is eligible, you're entitled to claim it. This is probably half our business is in this tax credit side of things. Companies, you know, there, there are misconceptions where, you know, certain manufacturing industries might think, hey, I'm not eligible. But the reality is that the bulk of work actually happens at the shop floor. And, and this is where, you know, these shop floor type uh, claims are where, you know, the bulk of the money that the, the federal government and provincial governments provide, um, you know, goes to those types of, um, uh, initiatives. And the other thing that I do want to, to highlight, you know, so if, if those of you are, are working in, in industries where they think, hey, I'm not doing any R&D, the level of work that they're looking for is really not, you know, a Nobel Prize level winning 
piece of work. It's really if you're able to incrementally increase your company's technology base, and that's your company, not the industry-wide. So if you, if you know another company is doing something, but you don't have access to their trade secrets, and you want to sort of figure out how to do that, you can actually claim that work as your R&D. So that is something to, to keep in mind as you, you know, go out in the workforce or you know, bring back to the companies you currently work for. And then the other categories are your defined grants. So these are the ones where you know, it's more traditional and you're, you know, a lot of you may already be familiar with these where there's a program out there, you write a proposal, you submit it. If it gets approved, you get the money, then you can spend it. So that's, these are sort of you know, an emerging area. Um, there's probably over 2000 plus grants that are sort of available. Um, intakes are, are you know, various throughout the year. Um, and they typically focus on you know, these sort of six areas. You know, they do support some R&D projects, you know, depending on you know, specific, I guess, priority areas that the government wants to, um, to fund. So you know, clean tech's really hot, domesticating our, um, our, our food security. So you know, things like ag tech, all of that is, is sort of where they would be funding um, you know, investments. Um, there's also you know, a lot of grants that you know, if, if a company is looking to expand their capacity, so a lot of capital investment projects could be eligible as well if they meet you know, certain criteria. And there's always you know, employment incentives as well. So if you're hiring co-ops, if you're trying to get specialized you know, trades or, or training your employees, um, you know, there's grants and incentives for them as well. And again, you know, there's there's very specific, you know, if you're looking to develop, um, you know, industries in rural locations or areas where there's, um, you know, need of economic stimulus, um, you know, there would be uh, funding available as well. And again, I think we we spoke about, you know, things that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, look, looking to green our economy, these would be, you know, areas where where funding happens. And again, um, you know things like new markets as well. If you're looking to export, um, there is funding out there that, that can help your company as well. And then the third category, this one's pretty um, exciting, I, I find, is the negotiated incentives. So basically, if there's a very, very large project that would have a very large, um, I said very a lot there, but uh, a large economic impact benefit to Canada, uh, there's an opportunity for these negotiated type of incentives where uh, you can basically negotiate with the government to come up with a fund that would support um, an initiative. So just sort of like an example, you may have seen sort of like the things like Amazon looking to, to find a headquarter. Those would sort of be, you know, things where, you know, there could be some sort of negotiated incentive behind to, to incentivize those, you know, international corporations to set up you know, a facility in Canada and things like that. Um, another example of this type of, of fund would be the Strategic Innovation Fund. And I think someone mentioned that seller earlier on the call, but um, I think there's, you know, announcements for, well, I think they received quite a bit of money there to support their, their COVID-19 uh, efforts there through the Strategic Innovation Fund. So th that's sort of the, the funding landscape. Um, you know, it definitely, you know, our work focuses more on the, the tax credits but we're slowly getting, you know, our, our practice it has a specialized center of excellence focused on the grants and the negotiated incentive side of things. And that's a, a growing and emerging area within uh, the GIQ practice. Any questions there? I know I kind of covered a lot there. Seems quiet on the audience front. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I guess the big question here, and I guess why we're all on this call is, how did Davis, the PhD dropout, ever end up at Deloitte? And that's just, you know, um, was it photo, stock photo, Jiang, I think um, that uh, people might be familiar with an, an MS word there. It's not me, by the way. So I think, um, you know, taking it back to when I left UBC, um, I ended up leaving my, my doctoral program after six years. So it's, it was a pretty crushing blow to my ego. Um, even though I sort of left on my own terms, it was probably you know, a, a good decision, I think, in retrospect, but it was one that I always sort of regretted. Um, it was one of those things where like, you know, maybe I should have stayed, maybe I should have you know, looked at switching programs earlier or looked at 
a different project early. So that that was something that I think really defined how my outlook, you know, going forward. Luckily, during my time as an undergrad and grad student, I developed a pretty good support network. I had, um, you know, even you know, going through that, um, uh, you know, the technology entrepreneurship course. Uh, you know, through solder, you know, I developed a lot of mentors, like people that were willing to just sort of take me under their wing and, you know, sort of guide me in, in you know, to places where like, I didn't really think I would have thought of as, as um, you know, going forward to. So I got some nice kind of experience and perspectives, you know, from those mentors. And I would sort of say, um, you know, highly recommend, you know, if you don't have a mentor, you know, they, they can e either be a mentor in your, you know, existing organization you work for or external. I would say, you know, seek one out because I think just having that external perspective um, and experience and access to their network is, is um, you know, really beneficial, um, you know, to kind of just help your help you out and kind of help you figure out, you know, where you should be going and, and um, you know, help you figure things out. The other part, too, is, you know, just being coachable. Um, you know, I think you know, I've had some, um, you know, situations where, you know, just sort of listening to people with a lot more experience than you and just throwing that ego out pays off in huge dividends. Um, you know, it, it actually supports your career because if people see that you're willing to listen and change and better yourself, I think it just creates a better outlook for yourself and, um, you know, where you can go in terms of promotions and things like that. And I think the other point that I want to, you know, put out here is, I think just showing up. So, you know, sometimes we end up in jobs we're not very happy with, and sometimes it's really easy just to be totally disengaged. But, but I would say, you know, just keep doing your best. So, you know, although it might not be your dream job that you're looking to do, people, you will interact with a lot of different people. And those people will notice how you show up. So I think that's always important that, you know, whatever you do, be professional and, you know, doesn't matter what you're doing now. It's, it's a stepping stone to where you could be going and, and um, you know, the doors that it could open. So my first career. So I had an opportunity, again, this was, you know, I have to thank my network to, to help me get it, landing this job. It was actually a pretty, I was actually, you know, pretty happy to, to land this first job. So, um, you know, after leaving the PhD, um, I ended up taking a job as a process engineer at a pulp mill. And I actually had the pretty fun job of trying to develop a biorefinery at a pulp mill. So it was pretty cool. I was able to kind of look at all the waste streams and see what sort of uh, value added products I can extract from that stream. So I sort of acted like an internal well, I guess you could call it an entrepreneur. So someone that was really looking to, um, you know, innovate within the company and see what you can do with, um, you know, with all of the side streams, how can you maximize, you know, the maximum amount of dollars from your raw materials that you're putting into it. So that was pretty cool. And I got, you know, exposed to doing techno-economic analysis as I was developing the process out. You know, looking at you know the opex and you know potential you know capital expenditures that would um, uh, you know be involved in these these you know mini ventures you could say, and then you you would sort of do your calculations and say, hey, am I going to make money in the worst you know in the worst case scenarios, right? So that was pretty cool and a fun job, um, and, and from that you know I, I, because I was just passionate about it. Um, you know, the CEO of the company really I guess you know took notice and. I was offered shortly the technical services manager job at that pulp mill. So I was now in, in charge of all of the process engineers in the plant um, involved in product development, technical sales and environment. So I got to go on some pretty fancy expensive meals with clients, with our sales team to, to sort of show, uh, you know, sell my expertise and sell um, you know, how our process is very stable and that we've got a great product, right? So I was able to kind of start that side on the sales thing. The other thing that I want to point out, and it's bold, um, this is my first exposure to being involved in Shred. So through all this product development work, we ended up claiming SR&ED. And 
I hired a bunch of consultants to help me out with that because at the time I didn't really know what to do. Um, it was definitely a involved process that involved technical experts that understood the eligibility criteria that the CRA put out there, you know, from a technical standpoint, and it also involves specialized accounting um, that understand how to capture the correct costs related to, you know, your product development efforts there. So that was my, my first experience into Shred, and, and we had a very successful claim. I think we received over a million dollars in tax credits, you know, from those claims. So definitely, uh, you know, definitely a, a nice experience to, to gain from that. And then I got headhunted to, uh, to take on an operations management role in another pulp mill. So now I've, I, I moved into supervising process engineers to supervising over, you know, 32 unionized employees. Um, also, I had to, I guess, influence without authority because I had, um, you know, my, my mechanical maintenance team that I had to make sure would work on, on my equipment when I needed them to. Um, so that exposed me to a whole slew of other types of soft skills that I had to develop. Uh, in order to be successful in that role. Um, you know, it's different working with, um, you know, other professionals. Um, if you're working with process engineers, you, you speak the same language. It's very easy to, you know, to work with them. But, you know, once you get into, you know, operations manager role, at the time I was a bit younger and, you know, I had some operators that were 20, 30 years in, in the role. So, you know, they would kind of look at me and say, well, what do you know? I've been doing this job for 30 years. So what can you tell me that I don't know? So a lot of it was being able to build rapport with people, use your soft skills, and really show, show them why what you're trying to do is ben of benefit for them. So it was a whole different way of thinking. And, and it's, it's almost like you need to provide the value proposition for what you want to do you know, to your employees. <laughs> And at the same time, I was, you know, I took a lot of initiative and, and you know, I ended up leading a corporate R&D project. Um, I saw a business need for something. We were trying to lower the cost of the paper that we're producing. Um, so one way of doing that is substituting different materials, but there's a potential for those materials to then decrease the strength of, of um, that product. So I looked at engineering a new material uh, with the help of, of um, some researchers at UBC to see if we can develop an additive that we can add back into the paper to increase the strength at still overall lower cost, uh, you know, to do that. So, you know, that was a pretty interesting, um, I guess, project that I, I got to be involved with. But again, this all came back to, I guess, some of the fundamentals I learned in that uh, tech entrepreneurship course, which was you know, looking at the value, uh, you know, trying to develop a, um, you know, you uh, basically, you know, entrepreneuring within within the organization again. All right. So, what happened after all that? I I got a call, or I guess it was more of a LinkedIn message from the partner that, um, you know, where, where I kind of highlighted the shred work when I was a technical service manager. So I got a LinkedIn message from them saying, hey, you know, I want to grab a coffee next time you're in Vancouver. So I kind of thought nothing of it. I thought, okay, well, I'm in this new role. Um, you know, the guy just wants to sell me some sort of services and stuff like that. So anyways, I was kind of, you know, I went into the meeting. I was like kind of thinking, yeah, he's going to see, well, you know, you want to do more business with me. I guess, you know, this is what uh, what's going to happen, right? But he actually ended up offering me a job to work with him. He said, hey, well, why don't you, you know, come back to Vancouver and, um, you know, work with me in, in my shred practice. Um, you know, you have the pulp and paper background. He had a lot of clients in that space and he needed people. So I said, hey, yeah, sure. Let's, uh, let's do that and, and give that a try. So that's where I ended up at, at PwC. That was my first job. I started out as a manager. And so one key message here is be nice to your consultants. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's a good message because you never know where, where you might want to end up at, at some point. Um, and I, I think, you know, working in, in the environment that I do, uh, you can definitely see, you know, you know, there's different types of people that treat their service providers in different ways. Um, but I, I think that's a good message out there because it's really easy to say, hey, 
I'm paying you, you know, X thousands of dollars, you know, you do what I tell you to do. But, you know, the reality is, it's more of that partnership role that you should be fostering, right, to maximize the value. And, you know, I think through that, that process, you know, we made a lot of money, we got a million dollars in tax credits, and, you know, the relationship was kept very well, and it opened up a door. So coming from sort of this industry role where I didn't have to do timesheets, I was kind of doing whatever I needed to do to, to keep my area of the business running and, and running well. This was now a big culture shock to me because now I was filling in timesheets. I was now worried about my utilization, my billable hours and, and sales. So I would say, you know, I was looking, I was, it, it was essentially the transition of me being someone that would look after a machine, making sure it works to then becoming the machine. So I, you know, I would be preparing the claims, making sure they're of sufficient quality and um, you know, making sure they're all done on time, right? So that was sort of the big culture shock for me. And I think the other part too is, you know, again, you know, I stress the importance of interpersonal, interpersonal skills. So a lot of it is, you know, the more influence that you can have through, you know, you, utilizing your soft skills and, and getting people to advocate on your behalf and work with you, I found, you know, that goes a long way in, you know, organization. I think, you know, it, it goes a long way in all organizations, but more so in a professional services firm on the client side and internally as well. So the other part too is defining your personal brand. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of really smart people in, in the big four. And I think those that are able to really define their personal brand. So. You, you either become a specialist in a certain thing or you're sort of known for, for something. And there's a lot of things to do within a big four. There's just like an endless amount of opportunities that are available to people that want to take that initiative. But my sort of tip here is, you know, really focus on where you can make the biggest impact. You know, wh when you're at a big four, that's, that's what you get noticed for is you don't want to dilute yourself and spread yourself thin through too many initiatives. Focus on the ones that count. Um, can I can I jump in for a question, Davis? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, when you say focus on, let's say, on um, a specific thing that you that you think that you can make uh, the biggest impact in, what if what if um, the one is really um, 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 a type of a generalist, let's say, um, someone who who is really good at facilitating stuff rather than being uh, an expert in one thing? um more into like you know knows how to manage things is that is that um is that is that something that can be valued in in the big four yeah so um i'm glad you brought that up so at, at deloitte um we focus on on essentially what energizes people so we try to ensure that people get to do what actually energizes them so if if project management and doing project management really well is something that empowers you, then a place like Deloitte will have you in a role that would focus more on the project management side of things. You still might have to do some of the things that you don't like to do, but that will be minimized and that will be, you know, worked on with your coach. So that is something that is valued within, you know, the big four is that not everyone's going to be that, you know, very charismatic sales leader, right? There's only going to be so much people. Some people are going to be that, you know, hardcore technical expert that, you know, it's, that you know, they're the the guardians that I, I mentioned earlier. They're the ones who are really analytical, but they're 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 the wizards, right? They're the wizards that are you know have a really good grasp of either the tax act or you know some other consulting skill, but they may not be the ones selling things, right? They would be in the background delivering the most value, right? So there would be roles for them too. I see. Thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. Um, and then the other part too is I would say focus on relationships and, you know, the transactional ones are the ones that are, are really shallow and you don't get client, um, uh, client uh, retention. Uh, that's not the right word, but it, it's uh, the loyalty. So, you know, when you start developing the really deep relationships and you just have the conversations with your clients and, you know, the, the whole goal of that is really to understand, you know, what are the issues that they're facing? Um, what are the, 
you know, things that they look forward to and things like that. And not every discussion is going to lead to a sale and that should not be the focus. The focus should be what, what are the problems that you have and how can I help you solve them? Right. So it's, it's really focusing on, on that. Um, I guess that thinking, because you could be even connecting them with someone else outside of, of the organization that you work for, but they will then come back to you because you will then be their trusted advisor. And that goes away, uh, you know, that, you know, level of, I guess, rapport that you have with that client goes so much further because if there is a really big deal that you can help them out with, you're the first one they're going to think of because they were the first ones that you thought of, um, you know, through things, right? So don't focus on these transactional ones where, you know, you're just trying to sell them one service. That, that's so small. It's, you know, look at the bigger picture and see what you can do to help them. Uh, and, and, you know, my goal is, you know, whoever my client is, I want to make sure they're rock stars. So it doesn't matter if I'm going to be, you know, getting a, a, an engagement out of them. I want to make sure they're rock stars and what they do. And they appreciate that. So again, you know, really focus on becoming that trusted business advisor, be the connector and really listen to what they have to say. There's a lot of valuable information that, you know, when you have these conversations, you know, with your clients, you know, it, it's, it's really important to listen because these can lead to, you know, solutions to problems they may have not even realized they had, and they will appreciate you for that. So I think this is probably one of my last slides here, but um, you know, in, in the big four, there's really endless opportunities. If you have the initiative to want to do something, I don't think anyone has ever told me no at the big four. They're more than happy for someone to take that initiative and make it a reality. It is a lot of fun. I mean, there's a lot of great people. We have a lot of great tools, um, you know, in a post-COVID world, when you're able to actually go and have your, your client dinners and, and lunches and things like that, it's a lot of fun connecting with people um, and just learning about them and learning about them personally and, and, and things like that. Um, it's a place where you'll be continuously challenged. There's probably, you know, a week where, you know, things are always different. You're going to be involved in so many different types of clients. Um, you're going to be exposed to so many different opportunities and teaming um, teaming abilities as well, or um, opportunities as well, where you can, you know, offer a holistic package as opposed to just your single service line. And that gets really interesting where you're, you're teaming with consulting. And then from that consulting angle, they might be doing some sort of AI implementation. And through that AI implementation, you know, you know, the, the grants and incentives teams will, will look at that and say, hey, there is a potential opportunity to actually claim your tax credits on that or there's a grant that can actually help you facilitate you know the training of your your workforce to um to be proficient in in you know further um you know uh, maintaining those ai systems that you're putting in place and 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 doing things like that so it gets pretty interesting once you sort of you're able to sort of bring that whole firm behind you um, and the other, you know, really fun part too is, you know, everyone's really driven. Um, as you can kind of imagine, you know, a lot of people that that are sort of in the big four are, they, they're all doers, right? So you're going to have a, a high energy team surrounding you. Um, and uh, I mean, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. It's challenging. Um, and, and, you know, it's a lot of work. So just kind of focusing on on some of the key takeaways, um, you know, through, through the, the, you know, chat today. So the, I was trying to find a curveball, um, you know, image is a little bit hard to find something on, on the stock photos. So that's actually supposed to be a curveball. And what I'm trying to mention here is, um, you know, for, for, you know, careers, you know, you're going to be dealing with the unexpected, you know, make them make the most of it, learn from it, you know, really try to find yourself a mentor, someone that, um, you know, can provide you with on ex external feedback and someone that you can bounce ideas off of. And even the crazy ones, um, you know, I, I, I still, you know, keep in touch with, you know, some of my past colleagues and past bosses and I'll run crazy ideas by them. And sometimes some of them, you know, make a lot of sense and I run with them sometimes. Always give your best. So this is something we probably didn't talk about too much, but, uh, you know, once you're in the big four and or 
you know, any organization, people are your biggest assets. Um, you know, it costs a lot of money, you know, to not mentor and nurture, you know, new employees or junior employees. It, it's way better to build, build them up as opposed to trying to get rid of them. So that's, it, it, you lose a lot of time. So, you know, people focus on your people. Relationships, super important, um, you know, with your colleagues, classmates, bosses, friends, whoever, relationships mean a lot. They, they will help you, um, even if they're your clients, building those relationships. You know, I think I have several clients that have become friends, right? And, and those are the best types of working relationships where you can then go out, you know, golfing with them, you know, take them to a concert. But they're the ones who are, who are always going to come to you when the, you know, they, they need help on something. So that, you know, that's where you want to build up relationships. And you know, if you do kind of screw something up, your friends are the ones that are going to um, you know, forgive you and keep working with you. Whereas if you're just focusing on transactional relationships, those are the ones that are going to walk next door to a KPMG or, or uh, you know, another, another big four, right? Focus on your greatest, you know, the, the activities that, that you can provide the greatest impact on. You're, if you try to do everything, you will stretch yourself thin and there's a very high risk of failure and, and that does not allow you to give your best, right? So, you know, think about that as you're all, you know, professionals all driven, you're gonna be presented with a lot of opportunities um, and it's easy to say yes to everything. It, that's, that's a really tough part, you know, starting out um, in your careers or even, you know, starting a new career is, is, is trying to find out where you, where you should say no to certain activities, right? And the last part here is, you know, I do want to mention, hey, I'm still figuring things out myself right now. So even though I'm a senior manager at Deloitte, there's a lot of things I'm still need to learn and, and figure out. So that's the end of my presentation. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Davis. I'm sure you figured it out most more more than we did, but <laughs> you're so modest. It's incredible. <laughs> Sachin, do you want to open it up? Yeah, like I'm just seeing if anybody wants to jump in. But yeah, I'm just happy to see like Davis is going back to school again, like doing his PhD, and interestingly might meet him on the campus. And I'm just curious, David, like. Like how do you like how do you like create a thin line between transactional and a personal relationship? How do you convert a transaction to a personal? Like any tips of that? It takes time and you have to be deliberate about it, right? So, you know, if I see something that I think is relevant to that person, you know, I'll send them you know, a note about it. Um, if I see something of that company, I'll, I'll send them a note about it. Uh, Pre-COVID times, you know, it would just be as simple as inviting them out for a coffee. Right. And the more time and the more time you invest in, in I don't like saying invest, but you know, the more time you spend with someone, you know, the more you get to know them. And, and um, you know, I think you probably have to offer something up yourself. Right. So something personal to open up that door, um, you know, to get to that level. Yeah, no, that, that's really helpful. I think the, we have Abdullah, like raise your hand, please go ahead, Abdullah. Yeah, um, again, thank you very much, Davis. Uh, the presentation was uh, just awesome. It's amazing. Um, uh, and it's really insightful. <laughs> um, so I, I do have some questions, not only one. Um, so the first one is actually just a follow up to what uh, Satyam has asked regarding, regarding relationships. Um, how do you let's say you connected with the with a new, with with, uh, with a new person who you think you would have a, a, a future uh, let's say um, who, who could be a future client to you how do you keep that relationship um, going you know just not just go go get to know them and have a, have a cup of coffee with them and that's it you don't know what to say next like because there is no personal relationship between between you and them so how do you keep that relationship um some well you know, there's different ways of doing that, right? Look, sometimes like if you're trying to build a, a deeper relationship, you could be organizing some sort of panel discussion and you can it, it, essentially, if you, you, what you can do is invite them to participate on a panel. Because what I always find is that, you know, if you can sort of, um, if you can honor someone's sort of abilities or, or, 
uh, you know, past experiences by by bringing, you know, bringing them up on a pedestal, right? Make them look like rock stars. That goes a long way too, right? That that starts, you know, building that relationship. It, it, it's about, you know, giving them and giving those, them those opportunities to be able to, to put themselves up on, on the pedestal. So, uh, and that's one tool. Um, the other one is just sort of making connections. So if you know they're in a certain business and you see that there's a certain opportunity for them to, um, you know, to help their business or help them personally, making that connection goes a long way as well because it shows that you've listened to them and you've listened to what their needs are. And this is what I was sort of, you know, mentioning before to be able to start building that, um, that ability to be viewed as, as that, biz, that person's business advisor is, you know, by, by looking out for them, right? So I, I would say, you know, if the company is, um, you know, in one business and they're either looking for raw material and you happen to have a client or, or a connection, make that connection happen, right? Um, you don't need to really get involved too much, but making that connection sometimes goes a long way. So there's a lot of different ways of, of, of nurturing those relationships, but it all comes down to what can you do to help that person? Yeah, um, personally or professionally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, to be honest, it's, uh, thank you very much for that answer because uh, while you were answering, I was uh, I was imagining uh, myself with with those people in mind, you know, and it really uh, truly really fits my uh, um, the way that I'm. Let's say I'm gonna deal with them. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Excellent. So uh, I see I see another hand, but I'll I'll go with uh, with another question. Um, you talked about sales. Um, how important it is to bring your own clients when you are with the big four and when you are with, with Deloitte, for example, right now? Yeah, it, it, um, it depends on the level that you're at, right? So as you sort of progress through the firm and, and you know, reach manager, senior manager level, um, it is sort of, you know, a core competency where you do have, like, I wouldn't say there's a quota in terms of sales, but it's, it's something that will help you progress to the next level. So if you're looking, you know, to become a partner, your ability to sell and, and, you know, it's not just your own services. It could be the other services within the firm Excellent. is, is um, an area that that's important. But, okay. you know, again, you know, there, there's also different paths, right? So, you know, as I mentioned uh, before, you know, there are those wizards, the guardians who are tech technically very strong. And those are the ones that you still want to retain, but they might not be the, the best sellers out there. Um, yeah. or, or like to do that, um, but there's a different path for them as well. Well, I see. Um, thank you very much. There is there's just one last tiny little question, if I may. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry if I'm taking so much time, but the uh, the question is, um, working with a uh, with the big four is it is it too broad that will uh, that will not really allow you to build on uh, your um, let's say um, your experience to start your own practice. Or would it be because I've, of course, I've never worked with with uh, with the big four. But I, like, how how, do, how is it? How does it go? I mean, I've, I've worked with with small and and big companies, not in consulting, but uh, you know, the small companies. Let's say they, um, you get you get introduced to a lot in in uh, in your in your field. Mm -hmm. right? Whereas when you go to bigger companies, you're really focused on one like uh, clear path. Let's say. Um, I'm wondering in consulting world and with the big with the big four, how how does it go? Yeah, so let me let me think how to answer that. So, um, I mean, you you the roles that you end up in, you you tend to be technical specialists in, in you you could say a, a narrow field, right? Um, and in terms of of um, you know how to how to bring. Uh, you know, some of your skills that you may have brought in from industry. So, for example, you know, I've, you know, trained in a lot of, you know, operational excellence, you know, Six Sigma type stuff. But, you know, those are things that I don't practice on a, on a daily basis. I, I focus more on, um, you know, the tax credits and tax, tax incentives. But what I've been able to bring from my industry knowledge is how manufacturing facilities work. And this is where I'm at, at, able to bring a lot of value to clients because I'm able to identify certain costs um, that could be eligible for, you know, a certain project because I know the process. So having that background and, and you know, having that industry knowledge, 
you know, if you're a subject matter expert in a, a certain process, that goes a long way with whatever you're doing. So either you're in supply chain optimization, you know, shred, you know, GI cube, um, or, or another area of, of um, um, you know, the, the practice, um, you know, there's, there's opportunities to apply what you have gained, right? So and I think your other question was, is it going to be too narrow to start your own practice after? Um, so, so did you maybe elaborate on, on that? Do you mean own practice within Deloitte or leaving and starting up your own company? Um, like leaving and starting your own company. Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's, there's probably quite a few cases that you could, I don't know off the top of my head where, uh, oh, okay, well, so, so we had a, a, a bit, uh, one part of our business through our, um, our artificial intelligence practice where I think it was more around uh, some of the contract management stuff. I think that was spun off and that has the partner that was responsible for that is running that business separately um, as a separate business. I see. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Abdullah. I think, uh, Davis, our next question is a chat by Sam. So Sam asks, uh, were there any challenges you faced when you transitioned into consulting considering your background is in chemical engineering? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously it's always challenging going from the engineering world to an accounting dominated world. And I think that the, the challenge was really the culture shock, right? So going from a place where, you know, you don't have to really clock your time, um, you know, you spend as much time on it till you get something done to now being worried about utilization, uh, you know, billable hours and, and all of that stuff. So that was probably the biggest challenge in terms of, of that, um, you know, that side of things. Oh, that's perfect. I hope that helps Sam. So, so our next question is by Chirac. Chirac, you can go ahead. I don't think Shirag is allowed to ask any questions. <laughs> I am really, I'm definitely allowed to ask questions. <laughs> Shouldn't you be doing this presentation, Shirag? <laughs> no, you know, like, 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 after hearing this great presentation, I definitely know a lot more about you, uh, a lot more about the practice. <laughs> so, you know, so, so, so definitely that's great. Uh, and thanks again, you know, um, I really appreciate you making the time for, for UBC SMCC. Um, my question is more, you know, so as you may know by now, you know, UBC SMCC is, is a place where, you know, there are members from different backgrounds, uh, different educational uh, background scales, competencies, and different horizontals, verticals, uh, you know, who really, uh, you know, the members are really looking forward to, you know, um, get exposure into the consulting world, get exposure into the kind of engagements there are, the scope of the engagements, you know, what does it take? and you know, uh, where they are, where they want to be, and how do they get there. Um, being in this space, uh, you know, what would be one advice from your side that you can give to aspiring candidates who are looking to join the, you know, the big four or the consulting space in general, uh, you know, to shape their career, uh, you know, that they can be, you know, they can be attractive. Uh, and then a follow-up question to that would be, you know, how, how do you get into big four? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think I could probably ask the, the question to you, how did you get into the big four? So I think it has to do with a lot of relation, with relationships, right? So, I mean, I, I got into the big four uh, essentially through, you know, my service provider essentially ended up hiring me, right? And I think, you know, with, with you, um, you know, it, it was again networked, right? So, um, you know, Alvero, um, you know, through Sauter also, you know, made that connection. Uh, I also do want to put, put a plug out there that, you know, the GI Cube team, we're always looking for, you know, good candidates out there. Um, again, anyone with software background, um, I think even oil and gas background, you know, we would be, um, you know, there could be some potential opportunities there. Shameless plug for recruiting. <laughs> we like these job ads. I had a question there, <laughs> okay. Uh, Sam, we, we have other people and like, I will, I'll let you know when you can ask the question if you don't mind. Because, yeah. Uh, so yeah, sorry about that. So we have Natali to ask the questions. Can go ahead. Hi, yeah. So thank you so much for the presentation. It was incredibly insightful. Um, my question is kind of related to the question that Sam asked. Um, of course, the transition from engineering to a more consulting and accounting world is really drastic. Um, but I was wondering, I know that interpersonal skills are really important um, in consulting, but are there any other skills, if you were to list top three skills, for example, that you took from your engineering world and that you brought into the world that you're in right now? Yeah, I think, you know, 
um, you know, some of the core skills, you know, the analytical skills that you, you develop as an engineer, uh, you know, in, in the engineering field is, is key, right? Because you use those same principles going into things, right? Um, depending on what your background is, but, um, you know, a lot of things, you know, are sort of based in the fundamentals, right? And how you analyze a problem and break it down is what you can do for almost any problem out there. Okay. So, so the analytical skills, um, so other, yeah, I mean, the interpersonal skills, I would say, you know, would be, you know, one of the top ones. Um, I would say that it gets you the furthest, I think, is the interpersonal skills, um, you know, uh, and then the other part, who, third skills, so analytical skills. Um, But I guess, you know, it kind of goes with interpersonal skills, but it, it's also that um, yeah, team player-ish skills. But I mean, that, that again is, is interpersonal skills. I don't know. I, I can't really think of a third right now, but. Um, That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I also come from a more scientific background. So it's really wonderful to hear um, that analytical skills always apply. You're right. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. So next is uh, Natasha. You can go ahead. Thank you very much, Davis. Um, that's a really great talk. So actually similar to the other people like Sam and Natalie, I'm also coming from a chemistry background. So I had experience in chemical manufacturing and then also now currently doing co-op in biotech industry. So I was just curious, um, what advice would you give to someone who is coming from a science industry wanting to transition into consulting? how to make that experience stand out when we are looking for a job? Yeah, so I guess, you know, part of it is, you know, I would say, you know, get to get to some of the networking events and connect with the people working in a space that you would be interested in. Um, I, I know that question was asked earlier and I probably didn't really answer it properly, but, um, you know, I would say, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, networking events that, you know, the big four hosts out there. I would say get to those events, get to know people. Um, there may be some specific areas of practice that might be the most applicable or most interesting to you. You know, go to those events, get to know people, and then, you know, speak with those that are in that practice and, and you know, try to ask, uh, you know, the questions around, you know, opportunities, you know, within those practices and um, see what they're looking for in terms of skills as well, because there's so many different types of services that, you know, Deloitte provides that, you know, someone in, in the, um, you know, chemistry space could be, you know, GI cubed is, is a place where, you know, chemists, you know, can work. Um, but if you're in the chemical manufacturing side, um, operational excellence is another area, right? So, you know, if you've done, if you have sufficient training in, um, you know, Lean Six Sigma, you know, there's there's areas for opportunity there in, in you know, operations, um, you know, uh, or operations practice as well. So there's a lot of different ways to, to pivot uh, when you have those types of skills. Yeah, I have a second question. Sure. So um, you also mentioned about um, building our brand by specializing when you have a career in the big four. So how do you know when to balance between learning many diverse areas first to get the diversified um, technical skills yeah. and eventually specializing? Yeah, so I think it's always good to have that broad skill set. Um, it's always something really good to have. But I would say when you know when you want to focus on a specialization, it would be more of a, an industry area specialization. Then you would be sort of known to be that person. You know, if it's the biotech area, you know, you'll be known as the biotech person that can, you know, help solve issues in this area of, of biotech. So that, that's where um, you would want to focus. Again, it's one of those, it's more of a personal journey on, on what your interests are and, you know, where you see yourself, um, you know, ending up and, and wanting to spend your time and, and being, you know, not just that one area of, of being a specialist, but being a, a specialist in that subject as well, right? The overall business understanding where it's going, its trajectories, what its challenges are, regulatory challenges, um, and all those things, right? So you want to be that holistic subject matter expert in that particular industry. Thank you. That's a very great advice. That, that's great. Uh, thanks, Natasha, and thanks, Davis. 
So I think we have, I think, two. Just Kenneth Chopu, I hope I still say that right, is the next one. And then Sam, you can go after Kenneth Chopu. Yeah, please go. Ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would say that was a great try. <laughs> um, so David, uh, you know, I'm currently in the chemical and biological engineering program at UBC. So it was, it was great to hear about your experience. Um, in particular, I enjoyed learning about how you outsourced projects during your time in the pulp and paper industry. Um, so now in your managerial position, how would you advise, let's say recent graduates to approach non-familiar situations, considering you know they are likely looking to also sort of showcase their skill set and kind of prove they were worth uh, taking a chance on. Yeah. Okay. So I would say it, you know it comes down to showing up again, right? So it, it's really about learning, learning things that you don't know about, you know, on on your own time. So if you're working in in um, let's say a chemical factory, it could be even just showing up a little bit earlier and shadowing someone that you want to learn or speaking to the operators. It's showing that initiative to be able to really dig down it and show that you want to gain those skill sets to be able to do something, right? And it's also talking about your, you know, to your boss and, and providing initiatives and, um, or I guess providing, you know, that honest, honest, um, I guess, uh, feedback to your boss and let them know where you want to go and what you want to try. And they should be working with you to try to get you those opportunities to expand your skill sets. And you can always ask, you know, I would say, you know, again, put the ego away and ask and ask and ask. There's a lot of people there with a lot of experience. And a lot of times people want to be able, you know, to teach and share their knowledge. I think most people feel pretty, um, honored when someone goes and actually asks them a question. So instead of trying to figure things out on your own, sometimes um, sometimes it is better just to go and speak to someone that you view as an expert in that area. Thank you, David. Okay. Perfect, Sam, you can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Davis. And similar to Kenne, I also have a, I'm in my third year of chemical engineering and um, I was going to say great question so far, everyone. Thank you for your insights. And um, similar to what Natasha and I think Natalie mentioned, you dis discussed being a specialist versus being a generalist. So my question is, how important is it to have industry background, for example, in oil and gas? Um, more, specific more specifically for you, you had experience in pulp and paper. Um, so how, exp how important is that moving into consulting versus if you don't have any experience at all. Because um, I've seen people finishing engineering, getting some experiences in engineering and some um, specialized industry. And I've seen people moving straight into consulting. So how does that differ from each other and how important is it to get some specialized experience yeah. in some industry? Yeah, so uh, I think someone that came from industry, I would say having that industry background allows you to talk shop with someone, you know, you're able to trade, you know, stories about, you know, trials that you've done or experiences that you've done. So I would say it gives you, it allows you to, I guess, advance quicker in a consulting world. If you have, you know, background in, in a particular industry, because if you have that hands-on experience, um, you know, it helps you from, you know, the conversation side, it helps you from just being, you know, having not the, the knowledge of a process or, you know, an industry. So it, it's much easier at that point to, to you know, potentially advance. Um, and yeah, I guess, you know, going straight into consulting from undergrads, I think, yeah, I'm not too sure, like from, I guess the technical background, you know, I see a lot of people that may end up with like a, an MBA, then, you know, go straight into consulting from that side. Um, but a lot of the technical people that I see that are in consulting either have some sort of, you know, industry background, you know, for a little bit, and then they make the switch over. Um, I don't have the right, you know, the uh, maybe experience to answer that question. Um, it just because, uh, you know, I guess, you know, I'm in a different area of, of you know, the practice, it's, you know, specialized in, in R&D. Um, so I mean, it's, uh, um, I, I would say, you know, the best way to go about it is, you know, find someone who is in a field that you want to do and have that conversation with them. 
a great answer. Thank you so much, Davis. I think that that's all. If anybody has, uh, we can ask the last question. Otherwise, we can just call it today. And thanks, uh, Davis, for his such a time after like at 7 p.m. So, yeah, I wouldn't keep him on this call. With already I have one so, final little thing yeah. that's not engineering or nothing specific. It's very soft skillish. Uh, you mentioned one thing about influencing without authority. And I found this specific skill extremely, extremely important in what I do. And, government uh, internal consulting where I have to work with like legal professionals, lawyers, deputy ministers, attorney generals, whatever else. I have zero authority over them, but they ask me to do projects for them and they think, you know, they have an idea how it should be done, how fast should it be done, how much it should cost. And I should just, you know, fill out the paperwork and make it happen. But <laughs> it doesn't work like that. <laughs> Something they wanted to do in three months, it just took us two and a half years to complete. So I... I wouldn't call it ass kissing because that's not how it works, but you just have to have a lot of conversations, I guess. And you have to show that, uh, that you're not just saying something because you think that's how it should be, but because there is a process, but because there's a logic behind it, there's a, there's reasoning. And if we go their way, the things wouldn't happen, but what, what's your approach? I want to learn more about how you handle this. I think this skill is, super neglected and super important <laughs> so so i guess this is more sort of like setting expectations of your clients right yeah yeah so i would say my go-to approach is having frequent touch points right so i would say you know if you're given a timeline you know kind of go back and and you know with what you've known from like a proxy project that would be sort of your basis in terms of providing that timeline if it's something completely brand new you know, you do want to set the expectation that you're going to try to meet their expectations, but at the same time, you want to be able to have those checks and balances that, you know, you can, essentially stage gating is usually probably the best way to go about setting those expectations, right? Because there's certain milestones that you know that you'll need to hit with certain projects, right? And, and you know, as you have those more frequent touch points, you can then inform people where you are in terms of the process and also identify the risk that could, um, you know, impact those, um, you know, the, the, um, the process, right? So in engineering, they always, you know, and project management, they always talk about, you know, the critical path of a project. So if you're able to identify what the critical path of the project is, you can then focus on, well, all the other parallel processes, you know, can kind of happen anytime through that process. But as long as you identify the critical path of the process, you should then be able to provide that as sort of your main touch point in terms of where you need to hit for certain milestones to be met.